Good day, my friends, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Daily Torah Broadcast, a ministry of the Messianic Discipleship Institute. You can always visit us online at mymdi.org and download previous episodes of the Daily Torah Podcast. Contact us and let us know what you're learning so far. Today we are on day 7 of this week's Daily Torah series called Ki Tisa. Yesterday we discussed Moses' meeting with the Lord in receiving the second set of stone tablets containing the Ten Commandments. Today our Torah portion concludes with Moses still on Mount Sinai receiving from the Lord all the instructions and words of the covenant that comprise the Torah we are studying here each day. If you have your Bibles and notepads handy, get them ready or listen and review later. But let's pick up the story in Exodus chapter 34, beginning in verse 18. In Exodus 34, verse 18, we read, The Feast of Unleavened Bread you shall keep. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread as I commanded you, in the appointed time of the month of Abib, for in the month of Abib you came out from Egypt. All that opened the womb are Mayan, and every male firstborn among your livestock, whether ox or sheep. But the firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, and if you will not redeem it, then you shall break his neck. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. And you shall observe the feast of weeks, of the first fruits of wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Three times in the year all your men shall appear before the Lord, the Lord God of Israel. For I will cast out the nations before you and enlarge your borders. Neither will any man covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in the year. Now, my friends, God here once again confirms and reinforces the holy days and Sabbath observances where we are to meet and appear before the Lord. We discussed these in our previous episodes, and once again, I encourage you to listen to our 41-part series on God's plan for humanity, where I go through each holy day and how Yeshua, our Messiah, fulfills and will yet fulfill each one. Yeshua kept the Sabbath in holy days when he walked the earth. He's the one who instituted them here and gave them to Moses. The apostles and early believers kept the Sabbath and holy days, and Paul never changed any of them. You won't find a scripture from Genesis to Revelation that says the Sabbath and Passover are only for the Jews and Christians are to keep Sunday and Easter. You won't find it. My friends, your Savior was crucified on Passover and was in the tomb for three days and three nights. It's impossible that he died on Friday at sunset and rose on Sunday morning. That's only one day and two nights, and the days begin at sunset. No, for 320 years, for 321 years after Yeshua was crucified and rose from the dead, the early Messianic believers kept the Sabbath and all the holy days listed here and codified in Leviticus 23. Our booklet, The Set Feasts of the Lord, which is available on our website, goes through each of these. And also, as a, as a listener of the Daily Torah podcast, you can have a free copy by putting the word donor, D-O-N-O-R, in the discount code when checking out. So go to our website, request a copy, put in the word donor, and you can have a free PDF copy of the set feasts of the Lord. Now, continuing in verse 25 of Exodus 34, we read, You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven, nor shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left until morning. 
The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Now, my friends, this command is repeated from Exodus 23, verse 19. It was a command to not imitate the cruel pagan fertility rituals practiced among the Canaanites. We discussed this also in previous episodes, that boiling a goat in its mother's milk doesn't mean you can't eat a cheeseburger. Abraham gave the visiting angels both meat and milk, and they ate it together. Now, continuing in verse 27 of Exodus 34, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write these words, for according to the tenor of these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Now, my friends, this is a covenant written by God and is an everlasting covenant. It is still in force today under the new covenant. Each covenant builds upon the next. In this covenant given to Moses by God, written by God, is the foundation that the new covenant is built upon. Again, I want to encourage you to listen to our in-depth series on covenant versus replacement theology on the Daily Torah channel. This was a completely unique and supernatural fast that Moses did. And Yeshua was the only other one to fast for this long without food and water. So my friends, let's continue in verse 29. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them as commandments all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. In verse 33, And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And he would come out and speak to the children of Israel whatever he had been commanded. And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him, God. Now, my friends, close communion with God physically affected Moses. His face had a shining appearance that was so noticeable that both the leaders and the people of Israel were afraid to come near him. After such a remarkable fast, we would expect that Moses would look pale and sickly. Apparently not. Instead, his face shone with a radiance and a glow so great that it made others hesitant to come near him. Likewise, my friends, our life lived with God affects our physical appearance, especially the face. The peace, joy, Love and goodness of God should be evident on the face of the one who follows Yeshua. Now Moses did not know his face glowed. He was unaware of the greatness of his own spiritual radiance. This was because Moses was a genuinely and deeply humble man. Moses' experience, uh, his, Moses experienced glorious, transforming, communion with God on Sinai, yet as he came down to the people, he once again involved himself directly in the work of governing and leading. My friends, when we receive divine revelation from God, write it down, share it, and let your light shine among men, for we have been called to be a light to the world that should not be hidden. Now let's turn to our half Torah portion for today and see how Elijah is doing from yesterday. In verse 
uh, 33 of First Kings 18, we read, And he put the wood in order, and he cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood, and said, Fill four water pots with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Then he said, Do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. Now, my friends, in wanting to make a deep impression upon the people, Elijah required more of Yahweh than he did of Baal. Elijah did not even suggest to the prophets of Baal that they went down or wet down their sacrifice once or twice, much less three times. Yet Elijah did this, confident that it was no harder for God to ignite a wet sacrifice than it was for him to set a dry one ablaze. Now continuing in verse 36, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Now, in verse 38, And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. My friend, some 50 years before this, Jeroboam, the king of Israel, officially disassociated the citizens of the northern kingdom from the worship of the God of Israel at the temple in Jerusalem. Nevertheless, Elijah still remembered the evening sacrifice that was offered according to God's commandment every day at the temple in Jerusalem. Elijah, like Moses, was a humble servant, and it was important for the people of Israel to know who their God was and who God's servant was. This was also essential, and it helps us to understand the whole event. Elijah did this according to the word of God. It was not prompted because of his own cleverness or vainglory. God led Elijah to this showdown with the prophets of Baal. When the fire of God fell, it went beyond expectation. It would have been enough if merely the cut up pieces of bull on the altar were ignited, but God wanted more than simple vindication. He wanted to glorify himself among the people. At this moment, the people were completely persuaded. Asked to choose between Baal and Yahweh, there was no choice to make. Obviously, the Lord was God. And then in verse 40, we see the end result of this magnificent encounter with the living God. In verse 40, And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal, do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. My friends, since this was a contest between Yahweh and Baal, the prophets, the prophets of each deity had to be responsible for their respective results. The great sin of King Ahab was his official sponsorship of the prophets of Baal. And now that the fraud of Baal was exposed, his prophets had to answer for it and were dealt with according to the law of Moses. So my friends, you want to know why we have evil in the world? Because we allow it to live and thrive and spread like a cancer. Not that we take matters into our own hands, but our spiritual and judicial leaders have allowed evil to rise and infect the whole world that it has now infested every segment of society and those who are supposed to be our leaders actually worship it as their Baal God. Now, let's conclude our daily Torah segment for this week with our Brit Hadashah portion. 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. And let's put everything in perspective for us today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, we read, Moreover, brethren, I do... I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Messiah." But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our example to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. In verse 8, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Messiah as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And now in verse 12, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, my friends, Paul wrote about the need to finish what God has set before us and how dangerous it is to refuse to give up something that gets in the way of finishing. Now he will use Israel's experience experience in the exodus from Egypt to illustrate this principle. Think of all the blessings Israel had in the exodus from Egypt up until the giving of the Ten Commandments and beyond. Despite all these blessings and spiritual privileges, the Israelites in the wilderness did not please God. In light of all these blessings, gratitude should have been made, uh, should have made them more pleasing to God, but they were not. And my friends, we are sometimes just like our ancient forefathers. We have a spirit of ingratitude and we allow greed, lust, and the pursuit of wealth to overtake us at times. We must resist these temptations. And the only way we can do that is by staying close to God, seeking his glory like Moses did. So how are you doing, my friend? Do you start and end your day with a morning and evening living sacrifice of prayer and thanksgiving? Or do you wake up in the morning checking your little iPhone idol uh, and who sent you a message and then spending the evening watching TV and social media clips? Which God are you serving, my friend? And as Paul says, let him or her who thinks they stand take heed lest they fall. Thankfully, you are plugged into the Daily Torah podcast that you're listening to right now and are being filled each day with his word and encouragement. So my friend, be zealous for God like Elijah was. Hold fast, stand firm, and slay the Baals that are in your life. So let's end it here for today. Shabbat Shalom. Take some time to meditate on these words and how they apply to your life. Pray for us in this message to go out and pray for those who are scattered throughout the world seeking their Messiah so that they will return to the Torah and their Hebraic roots. Share this message with your friends and family. Post a link on your social media pages and help us spread the gospel. You never know whose life you may affect. Remember to visit us at mymdi.org. Take one of our free classes. Download the daily Torah schedule. You can also order the Daily Torah series of books to follow along with. And if the Lord inspires you, 
please consider becoming a monthly sponsor so we can reach more people with these messages. Just click the giving menu option or donate button on the website. Tomorrow we will start our new Torah series. Until then, Shalom Aleichem, blessings and Shalom my friends. Thank <laughs> you.